here. It's really an honor to speak to you all. Um, it's also really bizarre for me to be speaking to you all here in particular, and uh, I'll tell you why. So, oh, that's me. Maybe I should start over. Um, so uh, a couple of years ago, about two and a half years ago, uh, I was working as a freelance journalist, a magazine writer uh, in New York, and I was out at a bar with uh, my editor, and we were drinking and complaining. Those are the two things that journalists do best, I think. Um, and we were complaining about the fact that for the magazines that we worked for, he worked at Wired Magazine at the time, he now works at the New Yorker Magazine, uh, we couldn't do the stories of the lengths that we sometimes wanted to do. Um, and we were also complaining that sometimes when the story went from the magazine, the print magazine to the website, uh, it didn't really take advantage of all the things that you could do on the website. It was just sort of thrown up there over five or six pages, and there it was. So uh, we were talking about, well, maybe we could start some sort of publication that would do this kind of work. And we got together with a programmer, uh, a third guy who was less into complaining but also into drinking. So we started hanging out at bars, and uh, we came up with this idea. So we would have this publication, and uh, we would do it all digitally, and we would sort of conceive it from the beginning digitally. What would it look like if we just said, hey, let's start uh, something in between magazines and books, and we just had it be for tablets and e-readers and on the web, what would that look like? So this was all going well and we were sort of designing it and Jefferson, who's the coder, was actually doing all the work and he was building something. Uh, but then the question was, where were we going to get these stories that we were gonna tell? And we knew lots of journalists, so we started asking them, you know, hey, will you pitch us a story, a story you might do for a magazine, but maybe it's too long. And uh, the result was that most of them said, that sounds like a great idea, uh, let me know when it starts. Because they didn't want to write for something that didn't exist. So eventually we decided that I would, the next story that I came up with that seemed suitable for us, uh, I would go write it. And it just so happened that I heard about uh, a robbery that took place in Stockholm uh, in 2009. And this is probably the first audience ever where most people will have heard of this robbery. Um, so it had taken place almost a year before, uh, but I was reading about it and the guys were about to go to trial and uh, it was very elaborate. It hadn't been written about much outside of Stockholm. So uh, I came here. Uh, I spent two weeks reporting it, paid for it myself, and then uh, came back and put it together, and that turned out to be our first story. So um, it's called Lifted. Um, and rather than walk you through the story, which most of you already know, I want to show you how we decided to start this story. So the, f the opening chapter, if you were to get our app for the iPhone, iPhone or the iPad, or you were to buy it online, the opening chapter of this story starts like this.
Now, uh, some, if not most of you, may recognize that footage because maybe it was on the news uh, here over a, over a long period of time. But um, that, of course, is the actual footage from the robbery itself. So at a facility called G4S, which is south in the south part of Stockholm, uh, those guys landed a helicopter on the roof of that facility and then robbed it uh, exactly like that. So the idea that as it evolved that we came up with was that we wanted to tell this story and it was a story of a robbery, but we didn't really care what mediums we used to tell that story. So if we could mix that video in with text in a way that would draw people into the story, we would do it. So we ultimately concluded that that footage was probably a better lead into the story than anything that I could write. So then after you were to watch that video, then you go to chapter one. So chapter one starts with the planning of the robbery uh, about a month before. Uh, and of all places, uh, it actually starts on Huepsalman right here, about 500 yards or 500 meters from where we're standing right now. Also, when I did the audiobook, I had someone, uh, a Swedish person, train me about a hundred times to say the word Huepsalman, but I'm still not sure that that's very close. <laughs> but you know what I'm talking about. Um, so the idea was uh, you would have text, and then um, in addition to sort of mixing in media into the story itself, we would also have a layer of additional things that you could bring to the surface. So for example, uh, if you didn't know where Huepsalman is, you could call a map up by tapping on the term. Um, if you wanted to see a photo of it, there might be a photo uh, designed into it just the way there would be in a magazine. So that's uh, a bench just on the other side of the hill. That's where they would sit and plan uh, the robbery while the uh, police tried to listen in. Uh, they actually had a policewoman with a dog that would walk by and try to figure out what they were saying, which she never did, obviously, because they uh, were unable to figure out that they were going to rob this place. Um, if you wanted to see the characters, uh, you would be able to, to also tap their names and bring that to life. So the idea was there would be sort of two kinds of media in these stories. There would be the media that was essential to the story, uh, like the video, and then there would be the media that you could bring to life in the story, and it would all be mixed in. So that's kind of how we started, was with that story. And then we've evolved over the, the last two years um, to become... Uh, what we consider a storytelling company. So, you know, what we make are essentially short books. Uh, in some contexts, you might call them long-form journalism. In some contexts, you might call them short books. Um, but we think of ourselves as a company that goes out to tell true stories and help other people tell stories. And what you call those at the end, books, stories, magazines, that matters uh, not as much to us. So there's two sides to that. One side is the actual publishing. So the original stories that we're going out and doing, like Lifted, um, we've done about 23 of those. And as Joanna mentioned, uh, one of the most recent ones was actually primarily a documentary film that had text mixed into the film. And then we create software. So we create tools that originally we created them to allow us to do this type of storytelling, but now we provide them to uh, other publishing houses and soon we're gonna provide them to uh, individual authors as well to do exactly the kind of thing that we do but even on a larger scale, because we're actually very small. We're based in New York, we have uh, 12 people, um, and we're backed, interestingly enough, by people on both sides of this, uh, this sort of uh, dual equation. So you know, on the software side, we're backed by Eric Schmidt, who's the chairman of Google, and on the publishing side, we're backed by, uh, or the content side, I guess I should say, we're backed by a guy named Barry Diller, who runs a company called IAC, and a guy named Scott Rudin, who's a film producer in the US, and uh, Scott Rudin, some of you may know, he actually produced uh, the Stieg Larsson, uh, American version of the first Stieg Larsson book film, which uh, could be controversial, good or bad in this room, I'm not sure. Um, so um, in terms of our stories, what we do, so there's the three of us uh, drinking in a bar, uh, which we still do, that's still where we hold uh, most of our meetings, um, although we do have an office now. Um, so we, we call that the atavist, what we, are the stories that we tell. So it's kind of like a magazine. Um, but the idea is that the stories are between magazine and book length, and they're sold both individually as e-books, essentially, and uh, by subscription. So we put out one every month. You can subscribe. You can get one uh, delivered to you. 
And we tell them in all these different environments. So uh, whether it's just for an e-reader like a Kindle or a Nook, or it's online through a web reader that we have, uh, you can buy them direct from our website or through an app or on your phone. The idea is that the story is the essential thing. Where it gets told, that's just a matter of technology. And then multimedia that's designed into every story. And just to give you a couple more examples of how we do that, multimedia for us can mean uh, a nonfiction comic. So we've done a story that's uh, about an Ethiopian immigrant who made his way to the United States, and it's told entirely visually with sound effects woven in. Um, it can mean uh, something that's a little more uh, interactive. So uh, this is a story about Mexican drug cartels, um, and you can have things sort of come to life out of that. It can mean uh, something like this, which is a story about Iraq, and there's actually an entire chapter of the story that is uh, animated. I'll it was, I think, September-ish 2005, um, and I was due to fly in from Dubai into Baghdad. I, I was working with a, a company, with a group of friends of mine that were, um, that, that had a security company. I was a, a security advisor. At the time, we, we were starting to take over security for the UN election. The airline that was running was a charter airline, and it's, at the time wasn't the sort of most um, efficient airline in the world, shall we say. Um, and flights were often cancelled without any indication, and you had to turn up there and just kind of hope. You know, you've got people sleeping literally all over the place. It's a bit like being caught in a snowstorm in the US, I guess, and, and you know, everybody's just got to sleep where they can sleep. Um, so we, I eventually just sat down um, in, in a chair. Um, I was probably the only sort of Westerner booked on the flight. Um, everybody else on the flight was, was um, Iraqi, I presume, in, in some way, shape or form. Um, and it just so happened a gentleman came and sat next to me. 5'7", jet black hair, very blue eyes though. You know, you could tell he was Kurdish because of his eyes. Reasonably slim, had a, a slight sort of belly at the time, but nothing too much. And uh, very well dressed, spoke excellent English. Um, and, you know, we were basically talking for about three hours, sort of discussing what we were doing. Um, and it turned out, you know, after a while, that he owned the duty-free rights for Iraq, i.e. He, he owned the rights to sell alcohol and duty-free goods at all the airports in Iraq. In Iraq at the time, it was, it was quite difficult to get a drink. What you could get was, was very limited in terms of it was literally sold out the back of somebody's house. Uh, so I was joking around, his name was Ahmed, and I was, I was saying to Ahmed, um, you know, if you could, you, you probably want to get some decent wine into Baghdad. And that's when he turned around and said, well, I could do, but I'm looking for a partner to do it with. Because you need a specific badge to get into the green zone. And I was just jokingly, I said to him, well, listen, if you're interested, I'll, um, I'll partner up with you. But I thought he was just joking around. And to be honest, we, we didn't really sort of discuss it any further that day. You know, I just thought it was another conversation at an airport. So the idea again is, I mean, that is a story that we sent a reporter out to do. Um, and he came up with the story and he, he wrote it. And then we, we took one chapter of that story and we had an audio engineer record the main uh, source in that story, telling that, that first chapter, and then we had it animated, which has a couple of advantages for us. One is that uh, it's a different way to tell the story, it's a different way to approach it, but it also gives us another piece of media that we then distribute. So we put that video out as a kind of trailer, like a movie trailer for, for the book that we're selling. And uh, it got you know, 20 or 30,000 hits on YouTube and Vimeo, and it's a way to kind of pull people back into what we do. And then finally, um, we try to do stories at least once a year uh, about music, because these types of uh, environments are so perfect for telling stories about music. This is a story that we did at the very beginning about a jazz musician from the 20s and 30s. And as you go through the story, you hear a soundtrack of his actual, he's a piano player, his actual music. And then in different places in the story, when it's discussing how he plays the piano, um, we have original recordings of that music. So again, the idea is to give the reader an experience that feels different. Um, it feels like reading, um, but it has some cinematic quality to it. Um, and it, and it doesn't, it's not the same for every story. So some stories have video, some stories don't. Uh, some stories have audio, some stories don't. But uh, every story has some element to it, and we're tr we try to come up with a new one every time that will uh, make it feel different than anything that you've read before. So um, 
in addition to you know being excited to just go do the stories, um, we also have to sell them. So uh, we have to find an audience for them, just like any book publisher would have to find an audience. So for us, that means we need to go find the readers uh, where they are. And for us, uh, the multimedia versions, we can tell on the iPhone, the iPad, we can tell them on the web. Um, but we also have text versions that we sell for ebook readers. So there's a lot of people who read our stories that probably don't even know that the multimedia versions exist. But uh, as a commercial proposition, selling them through these ebook environments is a way for us to find a larger audience and you know, make up some of the cost of doing them. So we've done, as I said, uh, 20 plus uh, of these stories over the last couple of years. Um, and then the second part of what we do uh, pertains to the software, where we're helping other people tell their stories. That could be organizations, publishers, educational institutions. Um, and I'll just talk really quickly about the way we do that. We have a software platform, uh, which we call Creativist. And the idea of Creativist is that it's reducing the distance between the person trying to tell the story and the readers, wherever they might be. So uh, it's eliminating the need to create uh, a lot of technological middlemen that you're going to, for instance, send a file to to convert, and then they're going to send it back to you and say, OK, now it's ready to go on a store. The idea is to cr have one technology that allows you to do all this in one place. And there's three principles behind it. Um, so we want the technology to be in the hands of the person creating the story, not in the hands of a programmer who's sitting next to them. So one principle is that it's user agnostic, meaning you don't need to know anything about technology to, to use the system. And that's because it was created for me uh, to do that lifted story. And I don't know how to code, basically. So uh, it was created for someone who is an idiot when it comes to you know, making a website or, or, or uh, kind of making something look the way you want it to look. The second principle is that it's media agnostic. It doesn't care whether a chapter is video or audio or text. Those things are up to the person who's telling the story. And the third is that it's platform agnostic. It doesn't care where you want to send the story. So if you want a text-only version, it can strip out all of the media. If you want a video-heavy version, it can figure out how to serve a file that's a 40-minute video. So the idea is to make storytelling something digitally that everyone can have access to, that everyone can create something that looks beautiful and feels different. And no matter what the output is and what you call it, whether it's a magazine, whether it's a, this is a bakery that is uh, putting out cookbooks using the software, this is the Paris Review, which is a literary magazine which uses it for their magazine app, and this is TED Conferences, which puts out a line of books. What you're producing is less important than the relationship you're having with your readers and the ease of which you can create what you want to create. So just lastly, um, in terms of where we're going, I mean, one place that we're going is we're expanding what we're doing in terms of publishing. So we've made a partnership where we're going to be doing full-length books and we're going to be doing fiction in addition to nonfiction. And we're also going to be moving into print. So as Joanna said, we're going to try to take some of these principles and apply them to print books and see what kind of creative ways we can come up with to take this platform we built and also make it output to print. And then we're opening up this creativist platform for everyone. So that means if, like me, you might want to write a short book about your cat because you're completely obsessed with it, uh, you can do that. And that can live right alongside the type of professional publishing uh, that we do once a month. So that's it for us, and I'll turn it over to Frank.